Today, I thought I would show you uh, like one or two instructive games uh, back from, my, from when I was very, very young. Um, I started playing chess when I was seven years old. I played my first tournament when I was eight years old. And by the time I was eight, I was beating my, my parents consistently. So I'm going to show you guys a picture just to start out with. Um, it's a picture from back when I was around nine or 10 years old. Um, this was, I guess, 2002, according to my shirts. And from when I was in, uh, in elementary school, I was traveling around the country playing in a lot of uh, national tournaments. And along the way, I, uh, I won a decent number of trophies. Some of my trophies were bigger than others. This was about half my size. Um, some, sometimes I would, uh, I would not win any trophies, and it would be upsetting. But that's part of chess. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And you have to kind of learn how to cope with your losses, learn from them, and then improve. So the game I want to show is a game from when I was very, very young. I was about uh, nine years old. I was playing someone maybe six times my age, at, le at least 50, probably older, and at least twice my size. He was at, uh, over six feet tall. I was probably around four feet tall, so maybe not quite twice my size, but uh, it was a very scary opponent um, because he was older than me, bigger than me, but in chess that doesn't necessarily matter because in chess, it's all about the mind game. His rating, his rating was 2,000. My rating was 1,300. So he, he was kind of bigger than me in, in all aspects, rating, age, size. But um, I won this game. And sometimes that's the amazing thing about chess. It doesn't matter about your rating necessarily. It matters how you play over the board. And I won this game in 13 moves. So in this game, my opponent played the Scandinavian. Anyone heard of the Scandinavian? It's a chess opening. It's also Ben Feingold's favorite pizza. And oh, that's a Sicilian. <laughs> oh, Scandinavian. It's, it, should, it should be a pizza. But anyway, I took the pawn. He takes. And um, he developed his queen very early. He was looking to beat me from the very beginning. But the problem with developing your queen early is it gets attacked very quickly. So my next move develops a piece and attacks a queen. Who can find it? Selena. Knight to c3. Very good. You guys agree? I, I hope. Uh, knight c3 attacking the queen. Queen had to move. He played queen a5. And now I play d4. So I'm just looking to, uh, to control the center as best as possible. And my opponent played sort of strangely here. He played c6. Not developing a piece, not really doing anything useful. He's blocking his knight from developing. Right, so I was a little bit confused, but I just focused on my own development. I played knight to f3. And then he played bishop to g4, pinning my knight to the queen. He's hoping that I touch my knight so I'd have to move it. But um, of course, I didn't do that. I played pawn h3, attacking his bishop. Now, black has a choice. Um, I want someone, um, and we'll take a few responses, someone to suggest a move for black in this position. Yes, what would you play as black? Bishop h4 or bishop takes f3. OK, that's a couple of responses. Would anyone do anything else as black? Anyone? Yes? Uh, you don't want to play h5. h5, even though it supports a bishop, it loses a bishop. And it turns out that there's a pin along the h-file. So doesn't quite work in this position. There's another interesting move I want to show you guys uh, for black, which is actually a bad move, which is queen h5. My opponent didn't play this. But if he did, white has an interesting trick. Uh, it looks like the queen is pinning the pawn to the rook. So if I were to take his bishop, he would take my rook. However, it turns out this is very good for white. Even though I just lost the rook, White to move, how can I take advantage of the fact that the queen is on h1? This is sort of uh, a bit complicated, but how, how can I perhaps uh, trap the queen? I think I've perplexed everyone. Yes, do you have a move? 92 is a very good move. Do you agree, Selena? Um, no, I was, I was thinking like g3. g3. Uh, G3, not quite. 
There's actually two good moves for white in this position, knight e4 or knight e2. Uh, knight e2 is a great move because it has a threat which is unstoppable. Let's say whatever black does, let's say black plays some normal move, knight d7. White to move, how, do, how does white attack the queen? Knight g3, who else agrees knight g3? Hopefully everyone, knight g3. Amazingly enough, the white pieces work together to control every single square the queen can move to. The queen has nowhere to go. All these squares are controlled by the white pieces. The bishop takes away h6, pawn takes away h5, as well as the knight. Other knight takes away these two squares, the pawn controls h3, and this knight on f3 controls uh, g1 as well. And the queen's attacked. So I would be winning a queen here. And what about h2? That's controlled h2 by the is knight. controlled by the knight, yeah. Forgot one arrow though, there. Makes sense to everyone. So black would not be able to go into this line without losing some material. That's a lot of arrows, yeah. Uh, let us go forward with the actual game. My opponent decided to take the knight. Probably not the best option. Usually when you're in a situation where you're pinning a piece, it's better to keep the pin. And the best move was probably bishop to h5. Just maintain the, the pin. Trading off the piece after bishop take f3 allows my queen to activate. And he trades off one of his only developed pieces. So now uh, white is ahead in development. I have more control over the center. Things are going well for me. Uh, he played knight to d7. I played bishop to c4. Developing the bishop and hoping he doesn't see that I'm attacking f7. But he saw it. He played knight to f6. Developing and defending f7. I castle. And now he plays e6. Um, so both of us are kind of in the, still in the opening stage, still completing development. I developed my bishop to f4. And he played a very sharp move here. He castled queenside. And this is something that you guys want to really pay attention to when you're playing a chess game. Whenever you castle one way and your opponent castles the other way, it's going to be a more, it's going to be a more attacking game. You'll see pawn storms, you'll see attacks, you'll see more sacrifices because White wants to attack the black king on the queen side. Black wants to attack the white king on the king side. So usually in a situation like this, it comes down to who can attack faster and who can create the bigger threats. So um, I start with a very normal centralizing move. I start with rook d1. And now my opponent plays kind of a, an interesting, scary looking move. He was a scary looking guy, so I guess this move suited his appearance. He played queen b4, fork, attacking my pawn and my bishop, both of which are undefended. Now I have an option. Um, I see a lot of hands raised, even though I didn't ask any questions yet. Um, who wants to guess what I played as white in this position? And we're going to go around, and uh, we'll, we'll just go around and see who says what, and then we'll see what I played. So we'll start in the front and then kind of go in a circle. So do you want to suggest a move? Bishop b3. Any other suggestions? Yes? B3. B3, OK. Any other suggestions? Yes. Um, the move that I played is probably the trickiest, and only one person said it. Bishop a6. Very clever idea. To open up that B5. So it's a trick. And I'm hoping that it's, it's kind of a hope move. I'm hoping that he makes a mistake here and, uh, and loses right away. I'm really hoping that he takes my bishop. Because after pawn take bishop, what can white play? Yeah, Luca. Queen takes e6. I was really hoping for this. But he's 2,000. He won't fall into this. Let's go back. Uh, let me ask you guys. What should black play to counter bishop a6? Any suggestions? I'm going to show you guys what he played. He played a very, very bad move here. Pretty much almost as bad as pawn take bishop. He played knight to b6. Now stay quiet and raise your hand if you see why it's a bad move for black. I call on quiet people. Yes. White to move. Queen captures c6. This pawn on b7 is not defending the c6 pawn because it's pinned. And I very simply take which is not only check, it's checkmate. 
nothing black can do to get out of check. And it was a blind spot for him. He didn't realize this pawn was pinned. And keep in mind, he's 2,000, and he missed maiden one. So of course, I was very excited after this game. Um, I beat someone 700 points higher than me. It's not something you see every day. And this game was actually featured in the newspaper the following week. And the newspaper had this position with white to move and checkmate in one. And um, it's probably pretty embarrassing for him to, to lose this way, especially, especially against a little kid and especially in 13 moves. So going back to this position, black should have seen that white spread is made in one. And black should have defended against it with what move? Knight b8. Knight b8 mm, might be possible. It's kind of passive, but it does defend and attacks the bishop. Selena? Queen b6. And this is a move the newspaper actually suggested, that black should play queen b6 here, attacking the bishop, defending the pawn, and keeping an eye on the b2 pawn. Um, so lessons to take away from this game. Nobody is invincible. Even old guys with big ratings can be beatable if, uh, if you catch them at the right time. Maybe even 3,000 guys. They, they, are, they are certainly beatable. So um, I want you guys, next time you play someone older than you or higher rated than you, don't be too afraid. And usually, um, usually the older guys are more scared of the younger people. So that should work in your advantage. Um, I played this game around the same time. I was 9 or 10 years old, still a young player. And again, this game, I'm playing old Russian guy. Old Russian guys are probably the scariest people to play in chess because the Russians are known to be like, very historically very good chess players. Uh, but this guy, unfortunately, also lost to me very quickly. And I was black in this game. He started out with e4. And we went in to a four knights opening. They call it the four knights opening for very obvious reasons. And my opponent continues. He plays bishop to c4, which looks like a very normal move. And I've noticed that, especially in a lot of kids' tournaments and, and um, kids' games, this position is incredibly common. Um, I, I might see this like, close to half the time in kids' games. Uh, people love the four knights opening, and they love playing this bishop c4 move. Um, it turns out that black has a very good response here. And black can play something called the center fork trick. So black to move. Anyone know the first move of the center fork trick? Yes, over there. Um, I forgot. You forgot. OK. Uh, yes, Luca. Um, it's, uh, knight take e4. Knight take e4. I think you've seen this before, right? After knight take e4, this is the first move in the trick. Uh, white will take. Um, now black to move, and this is the fork part of the trick. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Selena. D5. So they call it the center fork trick because it's tricky, it's a fork, and it happens in the center. And I'm winning my piece back. Even though I gave away a knight, I'm winning either the knight or the bishop back. And I'm taking over the center. So this is already pretty good for black. My opponent defends the bishop, plays bishop b5. I take his knight, and he takes my pawn on e5. Now we reach this position, which it looks like black is under some pressure. White is pinning my knight. My knight can't move anywhere. And he's attacking my knight twice. It's only defended once. So what can black do here to not only defend the knight on c6, but also uh, white, black can also fork in this position. So black to move, play the best move. Yes. Bishop d7, not a bad move, but there's a better move. Yes? Queen d5. This is what we call a multi-purpose move. It's doing a bunch of things in just one move. It's attacking the knight, attacking the bishop, defending my own knight, and also just dominating the center. And now white is actually in a pickle. Uh, white, uh, my opponent, decided to take the knight with check. What should I take back with, the queen or the pawn? You can shout it out. The pawn, of course. I don't want to take with queen. I want to take with pawn, because the knight is still controlling c6. And now his knight is smack in the center. And I want to ask you guys uh, kind of a funny question. What animal is a knight most like? Yeah? Anyone? 
A horse, right? Is everyone going to say horse? Yeah. I'm going to beg to differ. A knight is most like an octopus. And let me explain. An octopus has how many, how many tentacles does an octopus have? Eight, right? When the knight is in the center of the board, it has eight squares it can move to. So next time you look at your knights, you should think more about octopuses or octopi than uh, the knights um, or than horses. So in this position, the knight has eight different moves. So it's, it's smack in the center. I want you guys to figure out the only safe square for the knight. Because most of these squares are not, uh, not good squares for the knight. Selena, what would you play? Knight g4. This is the only safe square for the knight. It's not safe. It's not safe. It's not safe. It's not safe. Why? OK, what does Luca think? Same thing? Yeah. Um, yeah, the bishop can take on g4, but then the queen could take back. So it turns out the knight is protected on g4. All other squares are bad for the knight. All, the, all other squares, I could take it very easily. But g4, it's the only protected square. So it's saved by, by the queen. So let me ask you guys, should I take the knight or do something else in this position? Would anyone want to take the knight? Anyone? OK, good. You don't want to take the knight here because it would help white activate the queen. So instead, I want you guys to find a move. My next move is actually one of the strongest moves of the game. Find a move for black, which prevents white from castling. It's easy. OK. See it? Yes? I think bishop e5, bishop no queen. Queen b5. Or, or queen c4. Or queen or c4. OK. Four. Very interesting. Does anyone have any other suggestions? Yes. Bishop a6. Bishop a6. So it turns out all of these moves prevent white from castling, because all of them control this very key f1 square. The move I played was bishop a6. I wanted to keep my queen in the center and develop my bishop. Now it turns out that the king cannot castle. Can't castle through check. Chess base will yell at you if you try it. <coughs> Doesn't work. Um, now, this is very important, because I'm preventing white from doing something that usually you have to do in the opening. You have to castle to get your king safe. And now that I've, I've kind of trapped the king in the center, it's a lot easier to attack. So this move bishop a6 actually allowed me to win the game in just a few more moves. We're going to keep going. Knight to e3, attacking my queen. I played queen e5. White could try and castle queenside, but it would take a long time to develop the queenside. Um, now my opponent played a very bad move. He kind of freaked out in this position. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't castle. I don't think he wanted to move his d pawn because I would have a lot of attackers on it. So he played an even worse move. He played pawn f3. Has anyone been, been to a Ben Feingold lecture? Never play f3. Never play f3. Yeah, usually, um, usually you should be very, very careful moving the f-pawn. In the Sometimes it's OK, but very rarely. In this position, it's very bad because it exposes the king. And I played a, a very normal but tricky move here. I played bishop d6. Maybe. He took my pawn. And now I want you guys to think in this position. If you see it, be quiet. Let other people think. Black to move and win the game. Some people are very excited, but I'll, I'll let others uh, think of that. Then you, then you just check and take the, the h pawn with the bishop, checkmate, and hit the b. So queen g3 looks very suspicious at first, because the pawn can take. But it turns out you're exactly right. Who else was thinking queen g3? OK, some people. Queen g3 is what we call an invisible move. It, it looks impossible, but however, it, uh, it wins the game by force. The pawn has to take it. Now, what's the final move? Yes. Queen yes. Bishop g3. I think everyone can agree. Bishop take g3. And amazingly enough, the bishops coordinate extremely well together, taking away all the squares from the king. And the king is left on its own. 
So that's what's good about the bishop parrot, because they work together. The bishops don't overlap each other. One bishop controls the dark squares, the other bishop controls the light squares. Yeah. And the other good thing is keeping the king in the center. If I didn't play this move, bishop a6, then the king wouldn't be stuck like this. So it's very important that not only do you follow the opening principles yourself and get your king safe, but sometimes it's good to prevent your opponent from achieving all of the, the principles in the opening. And again, we go back to the idea that even when you're playing an older player, even when it's an old Russian guy, those guys are still beatable if you can outsmart them. <laughs> Any questions? OK, I think we'll end it there. Um, I think now it's time for, for free play. So I hope you guys can apply some lessons, and I'll be walking around to answer any questions. <laughs>